Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Please sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com for weekly updates about my podcasts, events, and more. Also, follow me on Instagram at zibbyowens and also at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. And finally, join my virtual book club called Zibby's Virtual Book Club, which meets every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time until 3 p.m. and features half an hour of book club discussion followed by 30 minutes of Q&A with the author whose book we've just discussed. You can sign up on my website, zibbyowens.com, under the virtual book club section, or even on Instagram under the link in my bio. I hope you'll find me in all these different channels and enjoy this podcast. Hi, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but I have an anthology coming out called Moms Don't Have Time 2, a quarantine anthology. And it comes out on February 16th and has essays by 60 plus of the authors who have been on this podcast. So first of all, please pre-order this book. I think you will love it. I'm so excited about all the authors who are represented. Um, Just to give you a few, um, Chris Bajalian, uh, Jewel Parker Rhodes, Ashley Prentice Norton, Gretchen Rubin, Rima Zaman, Eileen Zimmerman, and that is just from the first page of the multi-page table of contents. So please pick up this book, Moms Don't Have Time To, a quarantine anthology. It's available anywhere you buy books, Amazon, bookshop.org, and your local independent bookstore. So please pick up a copy. And also, I want to invite you listeners to my um, fundraiser slash launch party the night it comes out on February 16th, a Tuesday at 7 p.m., Bookhampton and the Children's Museum of the East End are co-hosting it for me. And 50 of the authors who wrote essays in this book, as well as many of the amazing authors who blurbed this book, um, who wrote little praiseworthy quotes at at the front, will be there. And you can be there too. So if you go to my website, zibbyowens.com, and just click on Anthology and go to Book Tour, you will see um, a whole fundraiser section. And for $50, um, you can attend. You'll get a copy of the book, and you'll get to schmooze on Zoom with all of these amazing authors. This is like going to be the literary happening of February. So please come. I would love to see you all in person on Zoom, I guess, but even see some of your faces. I know so many of you are really loyal listeners, and that makes me really happy. All proceeds of the book and the fundraiser are going to the Susan Felice Owens Program for COVID-19 Vaccine Research at Mount Sinai Health System. And it is named after my husband's mother, who passed away from COVID over the summer, which many of you followed along on Instagram as I uh, recounted that horrific experience. So all the proceeds are going there. The cost includes the price of a book. So thank you for supporting this effort and for supporting my book. I can't wait to see you there. Today's episode has been sponsored by author Joe Piazza's new podcast, Under the Influence. Under the Influence is a deep dive into the mom internet, a place haunted by aspirational marketing where it feels like every other mom is a social media influencer trying to sell you something, all while posed in white kitchens that never seem to get messy with toddlers and cloth diapers that never ever leak, a bastion of carefully curated lives that are hashtag blessed. And behind this airbrushed perfection is money, so much money, billions and billions of dollars, a multi-billion dollar industry we never talk about. Journalist and mom of two, Joe Piazza, brings a keen reporter's lens to examine how we got here, what it all means, and how the commodification of motherhood is driving normal mothers to the brink. And through it all, she wonders if she should just join the ochre-hued ranks of the momstagrammers, if she too can make thousands of dollars off beautiful photos of bath time, frolicking in fields of purple flowers, and posing her newborn next to a beautiful latte, and if this is the future of content. Check it out. Joe Piazza's Under the Influence. Hi, everybody. Today is day three of the February Book Blast, and it is Literary Fiction Wednesday. So I hope you enjoy all of these authors and interviews. Sometimes so many collect that I have to just blast out a bunch all at once, and that's what this week is all about. So if you missed Memoir Monday or Nonfiction Tuesday, you can go back and listen to those. And coming up is New Novels Thursday and Family Theme Memoirs Friday. So listen as much as you can. Dr. Brandon Hobson is the author of the novel The Removed, as well as Where the Dead Sit Talking, which was a finalist for the 2018 National Book Award and winner of the Reading the West Award. His other books include Desolation of Avenues Untold and Deep 
Ellum. He received his PhD in English slash creative writing from Oklahoma State University. His fiction has won a Pushcart Prize and has appeared in such places as McSweeney's Conjunctions Noon and elsewhere. He is an assistant professor of creative writing at New Mexico State University and also teaches at the Institute of American Indian Arts. He is an enrolled citizen of the Cherokee Nation Tribe of Oklahoma. Welcome, Brandon. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks for having me. So your latest novel, The Removed, is a beautiful story, so well-written, about all different characters as they relate to the loss of a 15-year-old boy, Ray Ray. Tell me a little more about what inspired you to write this novel. Where did it come from? Well, it came out of a question. You know, Chekhov says that fiction should begin with questions. And so the question is always what I begin with in my work. And the big question here was, how do we, how do we grieve and how do we heal? But I'm, al- I'm also really interested in the question of what is home. And, and I think that applies to this book as well as some of my other, my other work. But, but th- those are really the, you know, that's the, the sort of starting place for me or examining those questions and, and then sort of taking it from there. Well, I feel like you tapped into so many different things. It's like if somebody had an issue going on, it's probably in this book. And someone with Alzheimer's, someone with an opioid addiction, someone with loss, someone you know, like all of these things are so relevant to everyone. And yet somehow you even weave them in and, you know, threw in a, a foster care child to boot. Do you know what I mean? Like there's every, you packed so much in and yet it all sort of interwove seamlessly by how you divided the different points of view into the different chapters. What made you want to, how did you decide to sort of take this view by all the different people in the family and sort of shifting the the camera lens, if you will, like around to different places and perspectives? Well, for one thing I like, one of the things I like about fiction writing is getting inside characters' heads and and so here was an opportunity to take the Chota family and get inside their heads. And, you know, the, the different points of view are are all first person. So that means, you know, trying to have very distinct voices. I don't know, how, you know, whether I, I pulled that off as well as I could have. I don't know. But I, you know, that that's part of the, the fun. It's sort of like acting. And I think I, I heard Otessa Majveg say this a few years ago we i went to her reading and and then afterwards we went out to to dinner and talked a little bit but one of the things that she said and i think it's certainly true of of me is that it's sort of like acting in that you know you're 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 getting inside a character and really seeing how they respond to certain situations and you know that that's a big part of the pleasure of writing is doing that and playing with voice and circumstance and so You know, this family, I had the mother Maria, which, you know, she was maybe the most challenging because she's an older woman who's lost a child. And I didn't, you know, I wanted to try to get that, that voice somewhat distinct and specific. So I actually talked to a friend of my mom's and my mom's in her 70s and a friend of hers who many years ago had lost her teenage son. And so I you know, talk to her a little bit about that experience, which was hard, but, but I, it needed to be done, you know, so. That's true. I should have added this to the many themes that you touched on in the book, which is also like police brutality in a way, or really racism and targeting people on first glance based on how they look, which is what happened with Ray Ray in the, in the story. I mean, so many powerful, powerful issues to be explored, really it's really amazing. So when you sit down to write this book and okay, fine, we have Chekhov's question, right? This is the question you're doing. How did you decide how to craft all of these characters and have, and what you were going to tackle in their passages? Like, what did you, did you, did you start it off and do, I mean, obviously you did research by talking to your mom's friend. Did you research all the characters? Did you outline the whole thing? Did you, did they just appear in your head? Yeah, I, you know, that's that's a very difficult question. It's, you know, where do characters sort of come from? And, and I, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily outline, but I start more with an image. So sometimes images will come, you know, that I'll, I'll see, and I'm not sure where, what the scene is or when it takes place, but I'll see a character doing something, right? You know, and I think for Edgar's part, which is probably the strangest 
of all of them because he does have some addiction problems. And, you know, it, it, I wanted those sections to be the most surreal, you know, the most strange, not only because of his drug use, but also because he finds himself in this sort of mythical place called the Darkening Land, which is taken out of the Darkening Land is out of old Cherokee stories. That's a specific place. But in this place, I kind of had free reign to create it however I wanted to. And I really wanted to hone in on the strangeness of this place and and kind of hopefully parallel it to the strangeness of the country we're living in right now in terms of look at the way that racism is, you know, is, is so prevalent today and the way that video games are used and virtual reality and, you know, that Edgar becomes a target of a game that he fears for his life, you know, a shooting game, a real shooting game that he becomes. And but I was able to to, you know, that was that was really exciting because that was, again, crafting out of a kind of an alternate universe, you know, a very dreamlike, surreal place. So those his sections were really fun. I knew that so- I wanted Sonia to be very obsessive and, you know, obsessed with romantic you know, the, the sort of, she, she's, she's a very strong woman and she's very confident, but she finds herself involved with a guy who is, is not native, who becomes very dangerous, right? And I, I knew that I wanted Sonia's character to be in a situation with someone who is dangerous. Again, so she's placed in danger. Edgar's placed in danger in the darkening land. And, you know, the mother, Maria, is really the one that, you know, is trying to to pull everything together, right? She's dealing with her husband's Alzheimer's and, you know, her husband Ernest is just really, you know, suffering from his Alzheimer's. But, but then they take in this wonderful little boy named Wyatt who almost feels like he begins to heal Ernest because of, look at how closely he resembles Ray Ray from 15, 20 years ago, right? It was just sort of at the beginning, it just was taking off, you know, and I was I was doing each character separately. I was writing, and here's the way I, I knew that, you know, I was writing Sonia's, her thread, and I was writing Edgar's thread. And I knew, you know, with Maria and Ernest, you know, the threads just sort of just started taking off. And I think that's often what happens when you start writing and you really get to know your, your characters very intimately, very well. They, they sort of start doing things on their own and you just kind of follow along. So I don't really, I don't really outline much. All that sort of stuff comes with, with editing afterwards is to help, help with the structure and shape after the draft. But I think the most fun part is the very first draft because you're just, you know, Charles Johnson said that uh, if you, Charles Johnson, he wrote this fantastic craft book. He was a student of, uh, John Gardner's, but Charles Johnson in his craft book talked about the pleasure, you know, the fun of writing and that craft, that p- finding that pleasure really is where I feel, I, for me, it's, I feel very strongly about that and its importance to my work. How many times do you think you started novels at this point? Like, have there been others that you've started that haven't been finished? Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, my twenties, you know, back in the 90s, I had several novels that it, I don't know, it took me a really long time. I've been writing for, you know, since I started college for, you know, 30 years. And so, I mean, at some point I, I wasn't writing as a, as a kid, you know, fit, but I started writing fiction in college. And so it's been a long time. It, it, I just, you know, it's taken a long time to develop, I think, an understanding of how to do it. Right. Well, anything else, I mean, writing novels takes so long relative to like a round of tennis. You know what I mean? Like if you, if you only played five rounds of tennis, you wouldn't be that good, but people, you know, especially your first round, right. But people, when they, when no. they, because novels take so long sometimes, right. Then they think, well, because of all the amount of work and time invested, it should speed up or something, but it doesn't You still need no. the practice. Somebody, another author I was talking to said, well, it took me, you know, 28 novels to get to number one on the bestseller list. I'm like, well, that makes sense to me, right? Yeah. If you do something over and over and over and get better and better at it, then yeah, it stands to reason you might have your most success at your 28th book versus your first. Not to say that there aren't, you know, anyway. Well, there are, yeah, there are great, amazing young writers, you know, and that's, that's, 
that just is amazing to me. You know, when you have someone in their in their twenties, which is really young, I think, to be so good. But you know, they're out there, and I think that's great. You know, but it is a lot of work. I don't have a whole lot of other hobbies, really. I mean, I have two kids here, and so my hobbies are usually spending time with them and shooting baskets. You know, with with my 13 year old or my seven year old, you know, so th- there's an obsession about it, I think. And that's, that's probably true of anything. Like you say, tennis, I think one has to have an, an obsession, right. In order to, to really, it seems like to me, I don't know, there, there's probably a lot of natural ability in sports, you know, but I don't know if that's true with writing <laughs> this natural ability, right? I mean, I think people have natural, I think there, if people have natural ability, but I think that some people who don't can get really great at it. And I think some people who do can squander it. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I don't know. I have two 13 year olds and a seven year old, and I also have a six year old. And I find that that makes my ability to ever write or (laughs) be productive a little bit impaired. How has that been for you, especially with the pandemic? And how has that affected your writing to be, you know, Parenting. Yeah, it's really strange because my 13, well, as you know, you know, they're pretty self-sufficient and they can kind of do, you know, he can do stuff on it, like the math. I, you know, my wife has to help him. I don't remember seventh grade math being that difficult, <laughs> you know, but, but I like helping my seven-year-old, you know, he does, especially with the art projects. Like, I, you know, we went out and found leaves, which, I mean, I live in the desert. There aren't a lot of leaves out, but we went over to a tree and found some leaves few months ago and we're able to make birds and, you know, for, so I, I mean, those, those have been fun. I, my writing, because especially during the pandemic, I haven't been able to write during the day. So it's been between the hours of 10 PM and two or 3 AM usually. And during those, you know, four hours that I sit down to really think, okay, this is my, my writing time and I'll get as much, I'll try to get as much done as I can. And I, I, I tell myself, it's a, it's a success, even if I just go through and edit, you know, or, or write half a page or a page. I mean, that's that's a success because you know you can go days and days without without writing. But I'm I always try to I'm always during the day I'm always trying to to think about it, right? And I'm 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 kind of a night owl anyway, so I will sleep, you know, a little bit later and stay up late writing. But I've always been like that. Interesting. Did you feel like after your book got nominated for the National Book Award that you had like anxiety about starting another book? Like, do you, did you, or did that fuel your resolve to sort of write something else amazing? I don't know that it really gave me anxiety. I mean, there's so much out there. You know, there's so many books. Part of, I think this is part of for me was I, you know, I published a couple of books with, with small presses. You know, and I'm used to really not people not paying that much attention. I think that I don't know, it just sort of I don't think so much about it when I work. I think had that been a debut novel, like the first thing I ever published, it it might have created some more anxiety. You know, most of I guess most of my anxiety and I do I I do have anxiety comes more along the lines of when I'm having to be in a social situation with people, you know, and talk about it. I mean, with you, this, you know, one-on-one and I'm, I'm at, I'm at my house. So, but, you know, talking about the book in in front of large groups of people is, you know, gives me significant anxiety. And, and, and then I find myself, you know, having one too many glasses of wine or, or too many beers (laughs) to, to try to overcompensate, you know, and then I may embarrass myself, but I don't know, it's gotten better. I feel bad even, I I mean, I said the thing about anxiety because I was literally just like putting myself in your shoes and like, I worry about everything all the time. So then as I was saying the question, I was like, okay, this is my own issue that I am now asking. (laughs) So it just happened that you also like have that same thing. So anyway. No, I, you know, I, I, I do. I have severe anxiety. My, when I was a kid, I had such social anxiety so bad. It was, it was beyond, I you know, I, I just wouldn't talk for long periods of time, but it's gotten, it's gotten way better now. But yeah, I talked to a therapist my whole life. So that helps, you know. I had a lot of social anxiety as a kid as well. And I went this one entire summer on like a summer program to France where I just like didn't talk. I was supposed to go learn the language and live with the family. And I spoke a little in French, which now, of course, I don't remember a word of, but 
with my peers, I was so shy. I did, I like didn't open my mouth the whole summer, but what I found during that time, which I think of a lot, and I don't know if you do the same thing is I spent so much time analyzing language because it seemed so natural for other people to just talk. Right. (laughs) And I was so struggling with the ability just to talk and like figure out what would come next. And I just listened all summer. And I don't know, I think about that sometimes now as I ramble or, you know, write my heart out or whatever, how at times it's so hard to even form a sentence and how that ease of conversation, I don't know, it's sort of stayed with me. Yeah. I, you know, I, I went to Paris for the first time the summer before last and I taught for a week long writing workshop. And and that, that was the best, most amazing trip I've ever, I've ever been on. It was so great that, I mean, I, I love the language. I, I love the, the, the city. I loved everything about it. I'd never been out of the country. I'd been to Mexico once in my entire life. That's, you know, I'd never been anywhere else. And so, yeah, it was my, I didn't feel like I had any kind of, I walked around a lot, you know, and, and just, it was just amazing. And it makes amazing experience. So. Yeah. Interesting. Well, are you working on anything else now? Like what is it you're doing in the middle of the night? Yeah. So I am, I, there are a couple of things I'm working on. One is it's, it, it's too early to really know what it's going to sort of form into yet, but I have, you know, I'm, I'm working through, I'm, I'm going through this first draft and, you know, and it's, it's not much yet, you know, it's, it's not much at all, but and then I'm I'm working also on kind of a children's book. So not not as in real young, but as in, you know, middle grade, right? Like my son's a seventh grader. And so I've started that and hope that that I, I you know, I just like to do different stuff. You know, I, I'm in terms of writing stuff is a weird word, I know. But I mean, you know, I, different. I always like a different project. So we'll see. Yeah. Got to keep mixing it up. <laughs> yeah, there's always something I'm working on, always. Wow, that's great. What yeah. advice would you have to aspiring authors? Well, you know, I I think that one of the most important things is just, you know, this is what everybody says, but to read a lot and read widely with a very open mind, right? And then, you know, I, I think writing, the more you do it, it, it's almost like the more you do it, the more fun it becomes. and you know, if if aspiring writers are not in a program, you know, or have taken a workshop or a class, now that sometimes those get really bad. I don't have an MFA, you know, I, I didn't go for an MFA. I, I haven't, I have an MA in English, but then I, and then I went on and got a PhD. But there's something to be said about, you know, a community, being around a community of other writers and people who are in the same space with you. And you're all, you know, looking at each other's work and helping each other. There's, there's really a lot. There was a time in my life where I, I didn't have that at all. And so, you know, when I did, I, I became very grateful. And I think that that was largely what helped me become a better writer on a, on a level, on a, you know, on a craft level is, you know, having that community of people. So I would just say, you know, other than reading widely, just, you know, get your work in among a community of readers you know, that you can just share each other's work and, and talk about, you know, what's working and what's not working. So it's great yeah. advice. I feel like, especially now with the whole world on, on zoom and sort of your, your local habitat sort of opening up to everybody else, it's easier to find those like-minded souls than it was before when yeah. you were sort of confined by the people around you, right. Who might, who yeah. may or may not share your interests at all. But now, you know, you're in the desert somewhere talking about writing. I'm in New York City. It's just like, I don't know, it's so neat. <laughs> yeah. One thing I didn't talk about in, the, in terms of the new book was there's an ancestral voice named Chala. And, and one thing I did want to mention, if it's okay, was that Chala in the book is based on a real man named Chali. And so what happened was he was, was killed for refusing to, to leave the land, right? When Andrew Jackson ordered removal and, you know, before the migration, what, what ended up being the trail of what's known as tra- the trail of tears, some people refused to go. And, and there was one man who with his son died. And so 
this ancestral voice is based on him. And he's speaking to the to the Achota family in the book, I'll, uh, you know, trying to weave in. Here's again that that question of how do we grieve and, and how do we how do we heal? Right. And so he incorporates some, you know, the uh, traditional Cherokee stories. But it was also fun because I also had a couple of my own that I just sort of right. Was one of yours the who had the one about the deer, the doe talking to the guy who had to in the woods and he had to run and then he like stood where the I'm not explaining this well and then the leeches would get him and well yeah the leeches that's based on a that's that's based off a traditional story but you know the him rescuing the wolf and the wolf speaking through his eyes you know that that's that was me that's not necessarily from a traditional story so but I guess you know that to return to the pleasure of of writing to go back to the aspiring for aspiring writers you know it should i really think there should be a lot of enjoyment a lot of pleasure right i like the sort of strangeness of it i think it's coleridge right who said great art should incorporate some type of strangeness <laughs> I, I don't you know that was coleridge who said that so i don't know you know take what you will but i i do i do feel very strongly about the pleasure of of writing and if it starts to feel like it's not pleasurable and it's just work then it's maybe time to just put it aside and and start something else, you know. Excellent, excellent advice. Yeah. Well, this is great. We started with Chekhov. We ended with Coleridge. This is fantastic. I feel like I just had like a yeah. little little English throwback class here today. So <laughs> yeah. we're dusting off the volumes yeah. in my mind. <laughs> well, that's what I guess getting a PhD does to you. It's sort of yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> it makes you throw these these names out there. Yeah. I guess. Might as well but, sort of get your money's worth out of that PhD. If not, if not yeah. now, when? <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, Brandon, thank you so much. It was really a pleasure talking to you. And I hope this wasn't, you know, as anxiety invoking for either of us as perhaps some other settings. And it's been a no, pleasure thank you. to talk one-on-one with you here today. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It was fun. Good. <laughs> okay. Okay. Have a great day. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All okay. Right. All right. Bye-bye. Today's podcast has been sponsored by Under the Influence, a new podcast by author Joe Piazza. And just a reminder again, please pre-order a copy of my book, Moms Don't Have Time To, a quarantine anthology, and go to my website under the anthology tab for the fundraiser, and I hope you'll buy a ticket and join me for, and I should have mentioned, um, all proceeds go to COVID-19 research. So please join me for the fundraiser. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time To Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 